Welcome to The Loins of History, a podcast about connecting history to current events and correcting political and historical illiteracy. This is a very special episode as this week, Colin and I are joined by Professor Ty Campbell at Georgetown University. Professor Campbell is a adjunct professor whose research in teaching topics include information and cognitive theory, as well as at some point in the future, we'll be teaching a course on uh, Chinese information hegemony or information dominance. And we're really excited in this final episode of our U.S. and China relations series to have Professor Campbell on here to talk to us a little bit about that. So without further ado, get us started here. So Ty, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be a Chinese information scholar? Well, first, thank you for having me on. Looking forward to this conversation. I have been for a little bit. So I kind of backed into this whole thing from a different perspective. Normally when people talk about Chinese tactics or, or PRC tactics or PRC governance, they're coming at it from a national security perspective. And although I do that to a certain degree on, on kind of a daily, my academic work actually started in propaganda and in essentially media manipulation by governments. When I was in college, my first few classes in my English program were actually in rhetoric and composition and propaganda. We were studying essentially how everyday use and abuse of language can manipulate our cognitive biases. And that was actually during the first few years of the Iraq war. So it, it's kind of appropriate. I think it's, it's been interesting. I've, I've found it to be very fulfilling as an analytical approach to uh, basically most things. And it just so happens that uh, I've kind of had to focus through my job on national security issues and specifically on the PRC and relations, international relations in the Pacific region. Uh, it's been it, pretty fun considering yeah. that you, that it's such a large, a large target to, to look at uh, such a, a deep subject. They, P, the PRC is prolific in how much it publishes and yeah. in all the tactics it uses. So it gives a lot of material to create a, a curriculum out of. No, that's exciting. Well, we're super, super glad to have you on the show this week. So we've kind of thrown this term information hegemony or information dominance out there. What exactly is that? <laughs> So if you think about the term hegemony, it actually kind of comes from a long literature, like communist literature, actually, or socialist literature, I should say, uh, that is discussing power. Uh, and everybody starts getting upset when we start discussing or saying that everything is about power. Uh, but when you are dealing with communist or socialist regimes, it tends to be seen that way, kind of in a very realist bent. Uh, they they look at everything as a form of exercise in power or some in some form or another a system of power and so uh, when it comes to information people for a while have been saying information power but the way that the prc approaches information and in many respects the way that they talk about the us's use of information they see it very much as a weapon uh, and they see the whole system as being a weapon used against them uh, because it, they didn't have a hand in setting it up, right? They didn't get to help create it. So the system that we have now for them is actually a detriment to their progress. And so that whole system is a, a hegemonic system. It is, it is the prevailing system that is assumed in everybody's words, in everybody's interactions, in the international community. And they see that as a threat. So they are trying to gain ground. They're trying to gain traction um, in uh, gaining information hegemony. And a lot of times that means just produce outproducing others. Sometimes that means cornering the market. Sometimes that means infiltrating. Um, sometimes that means manipulating. It means all of it, right? And so information hegemony for them is setting up a new system of information power. 
And if they provide an alternative in every market in the world, they are essentially providing a new system, a new system of, of thought. And with that comes all of the assumptions, all of the biases of a, a new system. There are new values there. And that's what they are trying to instill as an alternative to our Western system. Okay. So a lot to, a lot to unpack with that. You, so the first thing I, I, was, I want to talk about is you mentioned the power dynamics and how the Chinese view information as part of this power system, this power struggle. Can you expand on how they utilize information both to maintain and increase their power internally and then how they are trying to erode U.S. power um, externally? Okay. So when it comes to uh, inform- control of information and, and having essentially holding the reins of the system of information internal to the PRC, uh, I, there is no... There is no more powerful person on the earth than Xi Jinping. Uh, the granularity with which he can see into uh, and have effect on an individual's life out of 1.4 billion people, like that is unparalleled because of the control that they have on the information, meaning they have all of the security cameras. They have more security cameras per capita than any other nation in the world. They have uh, complete alignment of all of the news outlets of all of the information producers, they have more than enough people on the internet that are able to police across the internet, across social media. And these are citizens that are willing to stand up and police their fellow citizens, let alone the the cyber armies that that they are said to have. All of that, that whole system is created to keep the party in power as long as the party provides what it needs to keep the citizens satiated. And there are not that many countries that can do that so thoroughly and then start projecting externally, right? Their national security laws are made to keep their citizens in line, even outside of their borders. Their national security laws also are trying to extend beyond just the Chinese uh, citizen. They're trying to go to the Chinese nation. They're trying to go beyond that border. They're trying to go to the Chinese diaspora, even if they are a citizen of another country. They're trying to keep hold of everyone that could call China their their motherland, right? And so that control goes beyond even the Chinese diaspora. You will see them exert intense pressure on people that are publishing items that are counter to PRC narratives. So a gentleman by the name of Clive Hamilton, he's an Australian academic. He actually writes about this prolifically in how uh, the PRC put pressure on his publishing company and in the local community in order for him to not publish the book that he was trying to publish on Chinese influence in Australian politics. This is a norm, right? They try to influence publishers. They try to influence publicists. They try to influence politicians, the press, uh, everywhere. What was that book called? Oh, sorry. So I've got Hidden Hand, exposing how the Chinese Communist Party is reshaping the world. And then Silent Invasion, China's influence in Australia. Uh, Yeah, sorry. Uh, So back to kind of the external controls that they that they use. They they don't just use information. They will leverage other forms of power. So think like economic um, incentivizing or uh, essentially penalties. Mm -hmm for continuing to allow something contrary to the PRC to be published. Like the social credit score. Uh, yes. Now, now, I don't know if they have quantified <laughs> uh, individuals outside of the CCP mm-hmm. or companies outside the CCP, but they definitely have certain communities, certain people, certain companies that they <sighs> prefer because they are friendly to the PRC or basically not necessarily friendly, but they aren't openly critical Um, of and a lot of times that's enough yeah no that so kind of a follow-on on on what you said at the beginning of that about the internal controls so kind of think of 
like George Orwell's 1984. Uh, it's not just enough to obey Big Brother, but you have to love Big Brother. And one of the things Jay and I had talked about before was like the cult of personality that Mao had built around himself. And now Xi Jinping has been doing and it. It's kind of contrary to what some of the moderates like uh, Deng Xiaoping had done. Is that cult of personality essential for the control of information and then the people writ large in China and really the diaspora that you mentioned? So I don't know that it helps with the diaspora. Right. I think that that's yeah. probably something that either rings hollow or is kind of a leaves a bad taste in their mouths. But mm -hmm. I think if you go to the historical record of essentially confessing your your sins against the party and that happening weekly. Struggle sessions. Something that, is that what that was called? Yes. Yeah. Those struggle sessions um, that has kind of come back uh, to a certain degree to where you mm -hmm. you tr try to show your devotion to the party by saying oh i'm bad because of the, I, I i thought about democracy today and i really wanted it you know <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> uh, what are they catholic yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now i i will say that the prc would claim that they are a democratic nation because they uh, the f officials are elected and somehow uh, in fact they're I'm pretty sure i read a report like an article in Chinese that was talking about the Carter uh, uh, nonprofit that went and observed their democratic democratic elections, mm -hmm. and uh, it was glowing, of course, because it was all in Chinese. <laughs> yeah. But the, they would claim that they are a democracy. It's just a, mm -hmm. with Chinese characteristics, and so this whole idea of open debate—that's not a thing. But democracy, yeah, sure. Like people get elected to represent other people. It doesn't mean that everybody in the community elects them. It means that the right people, because you're vetted in, in order to get into the party, you are vetted from a school age child. Uh, your teachers will say you like they will essentially designate you as a child, as one of the most patriotic and one of the someone that will grow up in the party as a leader. Those are mm. the ones that they designate wow. as potential uh, party members. And there's no like, well, I'm. I don't like the, I don't like the CCP, so I'm going to vote for the other party. There's there's, there's none of that in these elections. No, there's no <laughs> other party. I mean, so th there are the token alternative parties, and they are they vote along with everybody else at the uh, at the party congress, uh, but their responses are predetermined. In fact, all of everybody's responses are predetermined. Normally, there's one or two people that will not agree or not vote for the, the person that's supposed to be elected but they are told what they are going to vote uh, beforehand. So that way it's not a hundred percent because that's statistically not, not possible. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but one or two dissenting votes will be allowed, but they'll be told who, who they're going to be. Oh, you're drawing the short, the short straw. Yeah. You've got to dissent. You, <laughs> You've got to dissent. Can you imagine Gigi. being that poor dude? That's like your job is to be the guy that has to be the dissenting, like, all right, all right, Lee. You're gonna be the you're gonna be the Green Party candidate, <laughs> and you're gonna have to dissent on this one. We promise we won't kill you. That's gonna be a tough job, you know. Uh, probably yeah. It's probably not an enjoyable day, but normally, I don't know the procedures, of course, because those are pretty like close hold meetings. Not much information actually gets out from them. But I would assume that somebody higher up in the party comes down and says, "Okay, you need to be the dissenting voice." Switching gears a little bit, and I'm yeah. kind of shifting back to your intro, yeah. but um, some of the things that Jay and I talked about in our recent episodes were China's path to the 100-year marathon, their path to this global he hegemony, but we hadn't really talked about information. We've talked about things like economics, like trade especially, China dominating these trade agreements, the Belt and Road Initiatives, trying to expand Chinese influence through other means. Is information just another weapon in their arsenal that they are trying to uh, bring these other nations that they view as strategic partners potentially to counter the the U.S., but really the West and the traditional powers for the past 60 or 70 years? Is that kind of their, their plan externally where they're manipulating information to – or they're dominating information, I should say? Well, so I think what you hit on before is absolutely correct, which was like – talking about military, economic, kind of diplomatic power. And if you look at the four categories of national power, 
being diplomatic, military, economic, and information, of mm -hmm. course they would try to wield whatever power they can. But I think they actually did a really good job of analyzing their adversary uh, and saw how open our systems were. And they, they saw that we were disorganized in the information space. We have a very like rigid economic system, right? We, we try as much as possible for transparency. We have certain credit systems. We have finance, like we have all these rules when it comes to uh, markets and stocks and, and manipulation. Similarly, we have, to, we have a very strong military. And so the PRC said, okay, we have to try in those areas and we, we want to succeed. And because some other countries are, are not ban are willing to bandwagon with us when it comes to uh, corrupt, corrupt practice, practices economically, or at least just taking our deal over somebody else's because we're incentivizing it in other ways, they have been able to gain greater power economically. Similarly, yeah, similarly in the information space, they have seen that other people are willing to kind of go along with them on this. And they're seeing that our system isn't, isn't designed to wield information power. So I have to say this kind of tongue in cheek because they would also say that we are informationally powerful, but that's because the things that we do, people like. So like we, the cold war ended um, and you, you could essentially say people really liked Coca-Cola, McDonald's and Levi's, right? Like that's one that, that is one the cold war to some degree. Um, it was that cultural power and they are seeing that as a threat, a direct threat to traditional Chinese values. And so they're trying to put their idea out there of what that should be cultural value, what should be culturally valued. And on top of that, they are wielding as many information networks as possible, whatever domain that might be, um, whether that's uh, like cyber attacks through non-state actors, or if that's, uh, if, if that's providing free internet to islands or countries, or if that's providing whole news channels. In fact, the CCP, uh, Xinhua News provides news to so many states that don't have the money to produce news on their own. So the news people are getting is from the PRC. And that alone is going to start coloring people's views of the West and, and of the PRC, of course. Like the PRC, if you've ever read a Chinese newspaper, doesn't do anything wrong. <laughs> never screws up, right? It's always somebody else's fault or it's a corrupt official's fault, but it's never the party. No one ever falls flat on their face if they're the leader of the country. Because if that happened, they might lose the mandate of heaven, right? Like these the, things are, are still in the psyche. Uh, the emperor still has his clothes on. Right. Well, and will forever have his clothes on. Right. <laughs> it, he I, can't be naked. I don't think that happens. No. <laughs> he, he, can, he cannot be naked. That's a good way to phrase it. He cannot be naked. Whatever you think or you perceive, you're wrong. Uh, I, I think that sounds kind of like they, what was that? Jay, I think we talked about, it was Unrestricted Warfare. Uh, yes. Is that written oh, a couple yeah. years back in like 1999? Oh, like uh, and they... Yep. Yeah, they like analyze the U.S. and like can't beat them and can't beat them in a, a traditional in a traditional shootout or conflict. Their economy is really strong. What can we do? And triggered the, my memory to that when he said cyber and information and things like that because they're definitely looking at ways to exploit the U.S. Well, and he, uh, he also I shouldn't say he they those two lieutenant colonels they do a good job of laying out how we don't have a unified message, we don't have a unified culture, and we. We actually don't have an agenda, so we we don't consciously and deliberately move that stick forward when we are trying to wield power and or influence people. They, on the other hand, see that as an opening um, and as something that they need to leverage because they can leverage culture with a unified voice and vision. They can look at things strategically and say, that is that is my goal way out there. And I can aim at it because everybody's going to follow no matter what. Yeah, it's, I think that a lot of Westerners specifically tend to think in election cycles and the Chinese tend to think generationally. So that they're planning, you know, they're planning for 2050 already. And they're thinking 2050, 2100, where's China going to be? They're able to see into the lives of their 
their descendants almost. And whereas we're, well, we're anxious about 2024. It is kind of a culture, uh, a shift in culture. Yeah, it tends to be a symptom of our political system, like the, the systems that we've set up, mm-hmm. right? Like if you think about the two-year election cycle, we we have a really hard time with any memory that goes beyond that. Like, And as soon as one's done, you got another one yeah. coming right up that the new cycle begins yeah. immediately. Yeah. Hey, Ty, you said something real quick that I just want to make sure I'm understanding. The You were talking about how we we in the West don't have an agenda, but over there, like not only does their government, i.e. the CCP, have an agenda, but they're able to mobilize their entire society behind that agenda. Do you think that is just a reflection of the fact that we as a democratic society our like core value as a country could be liberty and freedom right like go do like individualistically go do your own thing whereas there in china because they're so authoritarian and not democratic it's oh the party has an agenda and everyone get in line do you think that's a fair way to characterize that yes a certain degree, I, and I don't want to. I don't want to give the false impression that everybody is bad in the PRC or anything like that. The the party essentially takes the biases that sees in its population or the tendencies in its population, and then just will shift them to mobilize. Right? When we say mobilize, we're not saying like everybody to the ramparts. Right? Like that's not what we're talking about. It's just accept what was just said in that last sentence. Right? Like. Whatever we just said, just accept that, like, and it's okay. Like, you don't have to do anything, but you just kind of have to believe it, or at least say that you believe it. And if somebody asks you, you you just say it again, right? Like, you you just repeat what we just said to you, and that's all you have to do. You don't actually have to believe it, um, but you definitely have to repeat it. But that's enough. Um, if you if you think of B.F. Skinner and conditioning, right? Like there are all sorts of complaints about him and I get it. But the whole idea of psychological conditioning is if you hear it enough, it's true, right? And it's funny when we talk about the end of World War II, right? And who believes who won and who fought. Uh, and you you look at the PRC's perceptions at that time. And if if we say, like, we came in to help you, uh, against Japan, a lot of people don't even know that in the PRC. And what happens when 1.4 billion people don't believe it? It's not true. Just straight up, sorry, not true. <laughs> if 1.4 billion people believe it, like you think you're going to convince them? So what we what we see is, you remember alternative facts, <laughs> right? Providing alternative facts. Well, we're providing alternative realities because no one knows. So when when you just don't have any part of that history in your uh, in your learning it just doesn't exist and that's fundamentally how things start there's a great book called never forget national humiliation and that book talks about the beginning of the opium wars and the the how horrible it was that such a grand history was marred by these barbarian foreigners and it continued until Mao came to power, right? And and Mao and the party saved the people in dignity. And so after that, you like because he was able to bring everybody out, there's this idea that all foreigners are tainted. Even if we the books, we've had a rich history <laughs> with China in the West and specifically the United States. Much of the wealth that was generated in the early period of the United States was through business with China, right? And not necessarily taking advantage, but actual business. And yet now we are where we are. And it's pretty much because a country who believes its grand tradition reinforces uh, an assumption to be on top, to be the hegemon, to be the center of the universe, right? Like Zhongguo, like the, the middle kingdom can could also be interpreted as like the intermediary, right? Like if, if you think of the intermediary between heaven and, and the lower states, like that could be the middle place. That there's a lot of ways to interpret that. And they believe like they they believe that they should be on top. And information wise, they are seeing an opening. Uh, and in fact, they are using it. Uh, they, they're using it all around their border. There's a, another book by... 
Kerry Gershanik. I think he used to teach either in Thailand. I think he used to teach on Taiwan as well. He, let's see, do I have it? Yeah, he wrote Political Warfare, Strategies for com- Combating China's Plan to Win Without Fighting. Um, and he details what China's done in in Thailand in order to influence and to take control of the information space. Similarly, on Taiwan as well. And he goes into significant detail about all of the, the uh, I should, let's see, the cor- corruption that goes into local officials, into uh, getting alternative stories published in newspapers to counteract any complaints from uh, in editorials. The PRC is prolific and thorough at the granular level, meaning one guy off in the woods complaining about the PRC, if, it's, if he gets that in the newspaper, somebody else will be there to counter that narrative, rest assured. And same thing happens with like diplomatic tweets, the whole wolf warrior diplomacy thing. I mean, that, that's there's another book called China's Civilian Army that's getting after that and details kind of how unprecedented uh, the, the PRC's diplomatic narratives have been against the United States. Normally, we don't openly, uh, well, we criticize, yes, but we talk about policy issues, right? We don't call out individuals. We say, hey, the, they're human rights abuses. <laughs> like We shouldn't be rewarding this state because of all of these unfair practices, right? Or they're doing something monetarily that is is untoward or shady. We will call those things out. The rate at at which the PRC diplomats on their public facing social media pages will criticize and kind of go go to go to battle uh, with U.S. not just citizens, but but specifically our diplomats or people in uh, more influential levels within the government, they're more than willing to criticize them openly. And it seems almost petty or and you get the sense that somebody's kind of insecure uh, because normally a state or somebody that's in that position would not be criticizing it yeah. in that detail or that level. Yeah. There's definitely some insecurity vibes going on uh, uh, there. So Ty, what, cause you, man, you've, you've covered a lot here. One, one question that popped to my head was. That's how our conversations normally go, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, how like, how successful do you think the CCP's been just in the last few years? Like, in principle, this whole idea of like Chinese information hegemony, it's big and scary, and they're like taking over the news networks and they're doing all this influence, and people in Australia are writing books about it. They're getting intimidated. Oh my, right? Like, how, like, okay, let's, let's go back to the 40,000 foot view here. How successful do you think the CCP's been in implementing this strategy? So uh, I, I think of late, we're starting to see some cracks, right? We're starting to see that it's kind of brittle, uh, specifically in the West, right? I should say uh, modern Western countries. So think Europe, think uh, United States, uh, Canada, even. We're starting to see that all of this influence is, or uh, attempts at influence are starting to come back and kind of bite the PRC in, in, in some ways. Uh, there's kind of been a backlash against Confucius Institutes because of the influence that they've been trying to wield on college campuses in like not either not recognizing the Dalai Lama or other uh, uh, other policies that might run counter to PRC narratives. So I, I think it hasn't been as successful as they might want, right? Um, but I would also say, take a look at uh, other countries, not Europe, not the US, not Canada. Look at South America, look at Africa. And although there are criticisms of, of PRC actions, for the most part, they're being, they are using uh, PRC or state-owned enterprise funded uh, infrastructure. They are using, and that infrastructure is not just highways and, and rail lines, but information pathways, right? Fiber optic cable, Huawei phones, 5G, right? And that is, I think, where they're cornering the market right now. So if you think about this influence stuff, that's nice and cute. Uh, to be honest, like the whole culture thing is cute. Where they are uh, amazing is getting the infrastructure, getting 
people to ride on their information networks so they can get they can do data capture that is where they're really making their money because that helps build ai and they know that that is where we're going uh across the globe so there's a book so time yeah go ahead oh yeah go ahead no no no, no. another book recommendation <laughs> um, so it's uh let's see it's i think it's trafficking data hold on i, I had it here somewhere trafficking data and it is the most detailed I've ever seen in somebody's research in looking into all the ways the PRC is just trying to suck up as much information as possible. Uh, go ahead. Now, Ty, I, as soon as we started getting into AI, like started thinking about this. So there was a, I think he was the former chief software officer for the Air Force, Nicholas Chalon. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He wrote a scathing like resignation letter. And of course, like the media picked it up, but basically he was like, I'm trying to help the U S out, but we've already lost the AI cyber war that is going to occur in 15 to 20 years. He's like, we're so far behind. And to your point about how the Chinese are able to just suck in all of this data, set up this infrastructure so quickly and so efficiently like we, and what he was saying is like, we cannot do that. So part of the criticism, and I think I read the article in the Financial Times, it's, there's, a, there's a ton of different articles that came out about it. But one of the things he said was, in Washington, we are burdened with bureaucracy and slow decisions and people that really honestly don't know what they're doing when it comes to cyber. And we don't know how to utilize people who do know what they're doing. Like he was saying that his bit, he was trying to innovate and he was basically like fixing basic cloud issues and setting up laptops, stuff that like an IT help desk guy can do. Whereas the Chinese were basically taking all of those private, quote unquote, private companies and they were aligning them, you know, like you mentioned earlier, they had one agenda and they, those companies lined up to help them out. Whereas Google in the United States and Apple and Microsoft, they are, um, if not completely resistant, very hesitant at best to help the U.S. Uh, so I, to make this into a question, how does the U.S. get better at AI and cybersecurity pertaining to information and winning this hypothetical war that may occur. It may not be the traditional bullets and airplanes type of type of war, but how do we win this? How do we better position ourselves? Because you just mentioned that the Chinese are, are moving to dominate that space. Ooh, uh, yeah. I think if I knew that answer, <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Be in Washington. <laughs> well, where I, I would be filthy freaking rich. It'd be great. Um, <laughs> We'd be talking to us at, on this podcast. At, no, I'd gladly do it. I just do it and not have to go to work in the morning. It would be great. <laughs> I think the hardest part is the PRC has done a good job of kind of educating its people and, and getting them to go along with this ride because essentially the CCP has promised that they're, they're going to be the best in the world. U ultimately, rejuvenation means gaining back our for former glory. And that former glory meant the pinnacle of culture of economics, of learning, like they're trying to get back there. We don't have that education in place, either education on, hey, we have this grand vision, just follow along, just trust us and we got it guys, because that's not going to happen. We know that. But we also don't take the time to educate people on what information is and how much value that holds. People understand that they are now monetized by Google and Facebook and all of the big tech firms, but they don't care because they just want, they want their app to work. Right. And so they'll go through all of the, the discl disclaimers and, and privacy rights like waivers, and they'll just click, I agree and go on because they just want to be able to use that app. They want to be able to make that payment. They want to be able to get in an Uber, right? That's already assumed that in, in the PRC, that that is the state's information right? Like they, they get to have that because you get to have a phone <laughs> because you get to talk to people because you operate in the public sphere. The person that's supposed to monitor the public sphere is the government as far as they're concerned. 
We don't have that. We allow our commercial entities to monitor our public spaces and make money off of it, uh, kind of without accountability. Uh, Europe has started putting in laws that uh, make that uh, harder. Uh, and from what I understand, Japan has too. We don't want to do that here because we look at that as cutting into the bottom line of companies that millions of people have invested in, including our legislators. So it's really hard to limit. Uh, it's really hard to change those privacy laws as they're written to benefit the commercial entities rather than uh, our government. I don't know that that will happen for our government. And I don't know that that's the right answer, right? Like becoming like the PRC isn't necessarily the right answer. But we've got we've to be a little bit more creative, if nothing else, from day one in grade school, because kids have already been playing on iPads and phones by now. We need kind of need to start telling them and showing them what that value is, that they are providing somebody else and they're not getting a cut up. Yeah, no, that's, that is fascinating. It's, it's kind of crazy. You know, sometimes you'll see in the headlines, you know, like a TikTok. We briefly talked about TikTok in our last episode. And it's kind of surreal to think that the Chinese government cares about information collected on an app that the vast majority of users are probably teenagers, right? Um, how, I mean, how do you, how concerned do you think average American everyday citizens should be about this reality? So I don't know that we have to worry so much about an individual's identity being stolen or, or affected by the PRC. I, I really don't think the PRC cares about that individual, right? Unless they are speaking out against the PRC um, or somehow celebrating the Dalai Lama or, you know, any narrative that is counter to the PRC. Um, Joe Blow on the street isn't going to matter. What matters, though, is how that person spends their time. What matters is what they focus on. It's what they believe. Because collectively, if they believe the PRC is a good thing, then PRC kind of gets to do what it wants. Also, so there, there's that. But then there's also the other side of if they just at least waste their time and are not and are less productive, then that also works because that slows down the economy, right? Like they are not producing, they're not making things, they're not buying things. As long as you're just wasting hours and hours on a screen every day, that's it. And that runs true for many people within the United States. That's actually better for the PRC. It means they get time to catch up. Now, you hear it's that, folks? Said, Serve your country. <laughs> get off TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's it said that the PRC limits youth viewing on TikTok and or other uh, social media apps, meaning they feed them a steady stream of STEM videos. That way they are encouraged to go into STEM fields when they become adults. Also, they don't get any more than that half hour that like mm. they're supposed to be limited to a half hour. Yet we get all sorts of stupid feeds. Like we have cat videos. We also have like uh, crazy people ranting. Mm -hmm. um, and you can look at that for hours, right? Like you can, you can watch Jello melt. Like we have some of the most inane videos that people watch for hours and it's hours. Called, it's called doom scrolling for a reason. Yes, exactly. And, I, most, most of it can't, isn't teaching morals. It's not instilling value in in some pillar of society. It's just wasting time. And that is a way to hurt, one, our culture, because we're not coming together. We're, like, we're not even strengthening our families, right? So we all of those social ties are going dormant and or being allowed to wither with time spent on just interacting with a machine. And that is okay by them because they see that as uh, something that they can work against. Jay, I just I just like to mention if anybody didn't listen to last week's episode, we made the same I made the same point again. So I think I actually successfully argued a point and changed somebody's mind li <laughs> live in a podcast. And then Ty just reaffirmed exactly what what we're trying to do. Yeah. No, it's interesting that it's TikTok is, even if it's just a time waster, it hurts us. Even if it's somebody is less productive at work, just one person, you know, and that's, you extrapolate that over 300 million. It's almost kind of like um, the, like 
more or less when opium was proliferated throughout China and the Opium Wars. It was kind of this substance that uh, eroded people's morals. It destroyed families. It created, you know, as a control, controlled substance that destroyed the cultural values of the Chinese. And I mean, we won't even get into the whole fentanyl thing, but like TikTok is almost the same thing. It's just like being sent over to the US, like it's being mass exported. They're making money off of it. They're getting their fix. And meanwhile, we just mindlessly consume it and destroy ourselves without even realizing it. I'm just kind of numb to it. Yes. And so uh, there's there's another book that I think you, you might enjoy, and it's called Battle for Your Brain. Uh, it's by Nita Farah, Farah Haney. She is a hot. She is an advocate for cognitive freedom, and she, the thesis of her book is that the technology companies, technology in general, can now map our brains, uh, and in in many respects, our the human side of us that it essentially is is the animal, right, uh, is being manipulated uh, because technology companies have such a good bead on how we think and our inborn biases. And now they're starting to be able to watch our brains in real time and, and or record our brain waves and understand, oh, if I show them this, then it will trigger these synapses, right? It'll trigger this pattern in the brain. And I was actually, I follow her on LinkedIn and she is prolific, right? She's very well connected. Um, and she presented a schematic of an earbud, like an Apple AirPod. And it basically within that, within the schematic, I think it was for a patent application. It was showing that it had extra sensors within the earbud piece that could uh, sense the electrical impulses in between uh, or like in your ear and in your brain. So essentially they're being able to map right. what is going on Right. You just wrecked me. Um, <laughs> what are you doing, Tim Cook? Thought you could get away with mapping my brain. So, <laughs> but I mean, this stuff isn't new, right? These are all behavior monitoring devices. Like if you look at your phone, like couldn't the camera also be tracking where your eye is on the screen? Like how quickly you, sh they know how long you stay on a picture. Like a, what is it? Dataclism, I think. Yeah. Christian Rutter was is it hello cupid i've never i've never been on any of those websites so i don't know what they're called Wait, is it a dating but website you're talking it, about it is it okay is. cupid basically okay cupid there yeah. we go um so he basically said hey from our questionnaire we will and and some observation of your behavior we know we know how you're biased we in fact probably know more about you than you know yourself we definitely know more about you than your mom knows just by the data that you put in there and then your hap your haptics so the habits that you have or the the different ways you, you scroll like how you swipe how quickly you swipe eye mapping like where where your eye tracks on the face of the phone they know what you're looking at they know what you're into and they know honestly that you're you're probably not as good of a person as you think you are right and and that gets scary and that's what Nita Farahani actually talks about is we, we need to have cognitive rights. We need to put them into law um, in order to curb collection of, uh, of our minds, right? Like, and although you're not going to see something like Minority Report where it's pre-cog, right? Or at least I hope. Um, I don't know, man. <laughs> you're getting close. <laughs> you, you, may not have, uh, you may not have three, uh, three psychics sitting in a pool of water, but you might have an AI. You could take all of that data and all of those you could take all of that data collected on you and put it into a very large model. And yes. that could be simulated against all sorts of other data variables and data sets that are collected and say, well, we think this guy's actually going to snap in two years because we know his marriage is falling apart and he's about to have financial trouble. So he's a threat. We need to go pick him up before he does something crazy. Yes. Uh, but there's, <laughs> I'm like, scared I... that you said yes to that, <laughs> that crazy <laughs> hypothesis. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So I, I'm, I don't think you're far off. I just, I, 
I think our government is too disorganized <laughs> to actually make that thing yeah. happen. Oh, at the God. time of um, at the time of this recording, we do not have a speaker of the house. So <laughs> yes, we are very disorganized. But, but I don't think I think other governments are organized enough to do that. Cough, cough, and I China. Think, <laughs> perhaps right. And if you if you look at the patterns of leveraging uh, weak points in character and or uh, leveraging economic value bribery to get their way, I think the PRC is one of those that would be okay with mapping somebody and understanding their psychological profile and then using AI to perhaps give some suggestions on who they should use to go approach him. Uh, is it a gentleman in his 40s who is an academic and this other guy's a nerd and he'll just really nerd out well and, you know, or is it a is it a thirty two year old woman about five, you know six, with these certain features who could then persuade him better, and and all that. But what what should the conversation topics be? What are the you know like this is this is most in I should in craft yeah. right like you you will know everything about that person before you meet them. It won't be hard you know to feel like you've known them forever. Right. To have that immediate connection to all of a sudden have the best friend that you never had and be leveraged in ways that you never imagined. Yeah. AI, I'll make it real easy for you. If you need to approach Colin, send some send like a 35 year old male in a in a kilt with a Scottish longsword who <laughs> enjoys doing what's the what's what do you call it when everybody dresses up in these like timepiece and like goes through the not the historical reenactment there's another name oh for you're it. talking about it's the Scottish called, festival it's called it's called LARPing. LARPing. That's right. You just need oh, a 35 year old oh, okay. Scottish, like, like LARPer to go up to Colin. Instant conversation. <laughs> I'll think I'm talking to one of my ancestors or something <laughs> like that. Ty, one more question for you for the sake of time here. And that is this, this whole concept of information hegemony. And this is, this is kind of a trick question. I'm intentionally asking the wrong question. You'll see what I mean here in a second. The How much of this concept of information hegemony, how much of it is communist and how much of it is Chinese, like conceptually? And I'm asking to intentionally try to bring out some of the threads behind like, and you mentioned some of the communist characteristics before, but also talk to like the Chinese, like the uniquely Chinese characteristics of this concept. So I, that's a really good question. Uh, I think where you have to look when it comes to the propaganda side, that is clearly a holdover from co communism, right? Like that is a grand tradition in communism. But there is a worry because the PRC has not always looked like the PRC. Uh, there are significant minority groups within the country. It has never been united until, well, you know, the CCP came to power and they said, these borders are our borders. Uh, so what they are trying to do is unite 1.4 billion people under the same umbrella with the same values. And it's really hard. And so to some degree, this is just a matter of, of controlling the population to make it manageable. Right. And so I think genuinely it, it's an honest worry because if you can't keep them together, there's really not a lot keeping like keeping all of these separate peoples as one. And so I think the, the propaganda side, yeah, that's probably a good it's it's fair to say that comes from the communist tradition. But there's a kind of a necessity that this is how they're making one China, right? One people. And I, is there another way to do it? Right. Like sometimes I would say it's not fair to completely criticize them for trying. This is a huge like we think that we are a social experiment because we're a democracy. Right. And well, they're kind of trying to do the same thing, maybe not asking people their opinion, but they're still trying to keep the train on the tracks. Right. And you have to do that through information. So and don't get me wrong, like this PRC should be. I wish it were different. Right. I wish it treated its people differently. I wish their governance system was different, but it is hard to conceive of a PRC or a China uh, 
with the Communist Party in power that wasn't doing this uh, because it has to, to a certain degree, just to make the whole thing work. They have to kind of get everybody on the same page. And although they have alternative histories and facts, for the most part, they don't have to deal in that. They have to just get people fed and they have to get people to work. So they are very practical about it that way, I think. Yes. Yes. Well, with all this excitement circulating around the U.S. and the world of potential doom and gloom dun, and a fall of dun, empires, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Jay and I are going to begin a series on the fall of different empires. We're going to start with Rome. Obviously, we're going to capture the TikTok. Of course, the TikTok uh, craze of how, how often, often does, does your man? man think about Rome? <laughs> we just bashed TikTok, and now we're going to pick up on its trends. We'll hey, capture a little hey, bit of that. Them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the algorithm giveth and the algorithm taketh away. <laughs> so we're we're not just going to talk about the fall of Rome. We're going to talk about the fall of Constantinople, the fall of the Qing dynasty, kind of visit that a or, little or bit. Or the we're Han, haven't decided all, yet. Or the Han trying to, yeah, why not both? Why we're going to go through all of these in probably one to three episodes, depending on the empire, but we're going to kind of dispel this notion that there was some apocalyptic event in each of these empires and one day there was an empire and the next day there wasn't it was always or almost always a slow and steady decline and relay that to see is the u.s next 